Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second in the series of Lunch and Learn presentations, Exploring Historical Generals. Um, this was Rousey's first in-person gathering since COVID, and it was our first hybrid event with both a real audience and a Zoom audience. Uh, we did experience a few bumps along the way, and we've made some adjustments. And uh, accordingly, this is a post-event introduction to Dr. Pat Brennan's talk, which was given on Friday, 13 May. Pat Brennan, now retired, was an associate professor in the history department of the University of Calgary since 1989. Having studied under Jack Granitstein, Canada's preeminent military historian, he took the leadership of David Berkison to spearhead the Center for Military and Strategic Studies at the University of Calgary. Dr. Brennan's research interests focus on the impact of the Great War on Canada, and in particular the transformation from civilian to soldier within the CEF's officer corps. Dr. Brennan has published widely in Canadian military history with research interest in Canada and the British Empire in the Great War. He is currently in the final stages of completing a history of the King's Own Calgary Regiment covering the years from 1910 to 1960 and will now join Pat's presentation as he begins his first slide. Um, that's a picture of Arthur Curry taken just before the war and his civilian attire is almost no pictures certainly during the early period of Arthur Curry until he becomes a, a serving officer in the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Um, Pre-war life, he, he was a, a man of, of no particular outstanding talents to his contemporaries. He was born and raised in Ontario, where he was a school teacher, a high school teacher in Strasbourg, Ontario. And then like so many young people in Ontario, married and otherwise, uh, he decided to move west where the action was in the immediate pre-war years, in his case, rather than come to Alberta or in God's country, Saskatchewan, where I'm from, he went to British Columbia, he settled in Victoria, where he also taught school and uh, was involved in, uh, I'll come back to this, very important point, was involved in certain business activities loosely described as real estate, okay, which was actually quite a common activity on the side for a great many uh, uh, professional people in the immediate pre-war period in the West. He served in the militia which was a very common occurrence for people of Anglo-Canadian background serving in the country. The militia was an incredibly important institution in Canadian society in the run-up to the First World War. It had been greatly revitalized in the first 10 years or so of the 20th century by successive liberal and conservative ministers of militia and defense. Uh, this was a time of sort of romantic view of war, of the ideas of manliness and militarism and so on, that the finest qualities of a, a man's life were exhibited in, in military service and so on and so forth. And so it attracted a great many, especially young business and professional men. Curry wasn't unusual in joining the militia, you know, in that sense, okay? Um, he was very good in the militia, but the surviving records show his performance in various exercises and tests and so on. Uh, that he did quite well. He was seen as a comer. He was young enough that he hadn't been in the Boer War. Many of the more senior people in the militia, in fact, had been in the Boer War, including those who rose to quite high rank in, in the First World War. But Curry was an exception. He had not served in the Boer War. The one thing he had going for him more than anything, though, as it turns out, coming out of his militia experience, was that uh, one of the officers in his unit was Garnet Hughes, who was the son of Sir Sam Hughes, the Minister of Militia and Defense in the Borden government, in 1911, and the man who would dominate, absolutely dominate the creation of the Canadian Expeditionary Force and the training of reinforcements and so on, per se, right through 1916. We'll hear a lot about Hughes. He entered sex very often, initially positively, laterally, very unpositively with Curry's own career. But it meant he had the patronage when the war broke out of Sam Hughes, not because he was a Tory. That's usually how you got Sam Hughes' patronage, because Curry was known to be a liberal, okay, a lawyer liberal, but because the attestation of Curry's merits by Garnet Hughes, Sam's son. Now, if we can go on to the second here. Uh, so, first division formed of expeditionary forces assembled by Hughes on the Great Chaos, but effectively, successfully rather, in the autumn of 1914 and dispatched. Britain wanted an expeditionary force from the Dominions. They wanted one from Australia as well. What they didn't really want was uh, formed units. They would have preferred they serve under British command and as part of the British Army and breed all that wonderful uh, uh, amity in the empire and not confuse matters with sort of proto-nationalist units and so on, people who wanted to be listened to. 
So anyway, the first contingent was sent over. Hughes was a man that wasn't, wasn't much but else to redeem St. Hughes. He was known as only by the mad mullah um, uh, shortly after the war yeah, began, yeah, most people yeah, thought, yeah, thought yeah, he was doing a terrible yeah, job yeah, creating yeah, increased yeah, chaos yeah, out of chaos, yeah, if that's, yeah, possible. that's possible. But anyway, he, anyway, he, uh, he uh, was very much a nationalist, uh, such as they were at the time, very pro-British, but very much still a Canadian, and wanted a, a separate Canadian expeditionary force. So the first contingent that went over in October 1914, uh, followed by various others, of course, as we know, uh, became the first division, the first division to go into action, most famously at 2nd Eve. In, 19, in April 1915, the famous gas attack. Anyway, in the training camp that he was assembled at the district of Dakarshi in Quebec City, uh, there were only three brigade posts. It was considered obvious. He was offered to command the division himself, but when that was turned down, um, it was going to be a British officer to command the division. That would be the case through early 1916, or through actually early 1917. But uh, brigade commands were the two or the, were the most preeminent positions a Canadian militia officer could aspire to, and Curry got one of them. Uh, I'm not saying he didn't deserve it, and I'm not saying he did in terms of such as they could judge these people, uh, but certainly the Hughes connection got in that position. Okay, uh, he had Hughes's uh, patronage, uh, and he would later lose it big time. But anyway, he gets to be commander of the first of the uh, first brigade. In, in the first Canadian division fights at Ypres. And uh, that's where he runs into his first problem. I'm gonna talk about the nature of this problem in the second part of the talk, but suffice to say that uh, the British uh, would have cashiered Curry after second Ypres for his failures of command because he was a Canadian and because Sam Hughes was the guardian angel of the Canadian division, the Canadian Expeditionary Force in general. Curry survives, and thank God, even the British would have agreed, given what a superb original and particularly core commander he turned out to be, thank God he did survive, okay? Um, he, he was, or rather, Curry then uh, uh, continues on as, as a commander, he's seen as a, a comer, uh, and uh, when a second division is sent over to France from England in Early in 1915, uh, um, uh, he or late in, rather, late in 1915, uh, a corps is formed, and the British officer Edmund Alderson, who was command, retired British general, who was commanding the Canadian the First Division at Ypres, and thereafter he was made corps commander. Curry is promoted to the command of the First Division, which became, especially in their own eyes, the preeminent division in the Canadian Corps. It was certainly the longest continually serving division. So Curry's career is immediately identified by the British as one of promise. They're constantly you know, stuck with these Dominion formed units that have to be mostly commanded by Dominion militia types. Uh, they look for the ones who are the most promising and Curry is immediately identified by the British as one of the most prominent. Now, you know, next slide please. That's, that's Sam that's Hughes, and there's a crisis. Uh, he's, he's actually a civilian, okay? You might wonder why the uniform came from, but he gave himself a uniform. He did serve in the militia, but he gave himself a major general's uniform and uh, uh, saw himself as the greatest military leader. He said this since Napoleon, okay? So we started off with an outstanding potential leader of the Canadian forces. Now, Hughes was, he was well intentioned, but we all, we know where the road to hell is paid with good intentions. So that really doesn't cut much with historians. It didn't cut much at the time. He absolutely monopolized. He's a megalomaniac and a detail guy. It's a terrible combination. Uh, he made a mess out of uh, promotion and appointment. It was all uh, basically who he liked and who he didn't like, and who was conservative. Um, he interfered endlessly in that. He uh, uh, held back some of the better more promising officers uh, at the expense of others who shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, he was involved in this boss rifle controversy. I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, he had a friend who was a senator, and conservative senator who made a rifle, it was a good hunting rifle, it was a bad military rifle, tended to jam. He required the Canadian Corps, the Canadian divisions to be equipped for this. And a whole series of problems, just incompetent organization in England, poor training, driving the British crazy. It got to the point after a convenient setback, the first, second division's first battle at St. Elwall in April 1916, that the British tried to clean house or were prepared to clean house. It got to the point 
the Canadians' raw material was terrific, but the performance on the battlefield was poor because there were too many incompetent people in positions of authority. And so the British intervened, and they finally get the government in Ottawa, Robert Borden's government. Hughes had enormous influence in the party in Ontario. He was an orange man, enough said. Okay, And so he had a lot of political influence. It made it reluctant for his fellow cabinet colleagues and Borden to get rid of him or to neuter him. But anyway, the British intervened and more or less laid on the law to the Canadians. They basically don't want any more Canadian units to come over. The consequence of that announcement in Canada would be devastating politically to the government. So unless Hughes's influence is removed and they get their way, they uh, appoint a new British general who had made a name for himself at Gallipoli. And it was hard to make a name for yourself, okay, at least that kind of name at Gallipoli. Julian Bing, Jumbo Bing, was a six foot four guy. He came over to take over the Canadian Corps along with several British staff officers who served, senior staff officers who served with it right to the end of the war. And he demanded that he have absolute control of the now three divisions of the Corps uh, over promotions and appointments of all kinds, that it'd be a meritocracy. The Canadian government agreed. Hughes would not be removed from office as, as defense minister, in effect, until the end of 1916. But after the spring of 1916, Hughes isn't a factor anymore in ways that matter in terms of the fighting proficiency and the professionalization of the Canadian Corps. And uh, Curry is a major beneficiary of this because he had become, on his merit, not only the most promising of the Canadian officers, but the leader of the faction who wanted to professionalize the army, and particularly on the issue of this infamous Ross rifle, wanted the rifle done. Hughes considered the Ross rifle in support of saying a test of loyalty. Had Hughes not been gotten rid of by the British in the spring of 1916, Curry's career would have been over. As it was, it could blossom. Have the next picture, please. There's Julian Bing, and that's Robert Borden. And the reason I introduced Borden here is the second big crunch comes in late 1916 when uh, uh, he was inspired for the cabinet, uh, proceeds to criticize the government thereafter, right till the end of the war, particularly goes after Curry all the time. But anyway, uh, the fact is he's gone. And something called the Overseas Military Forces of Canada is set up in Britain, it's a full cabinet post and with a powerful cabinet minister permanently resident in Britain to keep an eye on Canadian matters, including things like training and so on. At the same time, and to get some measure of independence vis-a-vis -vis the British high command with the Canadian Corps commander, even if for the time being, he's another British officer. In other words, it's the beginning of sort of nationalist sense that the Canadian army is too important for the Canadian government not to have a positive role in shaping it, okay? At the same time, the only other Canadian general, commander of the second division, Richard Turner, who was a possible rival for the best Canadian commander in the spring or late 1916, is sent to London. He's asked to go to London to mastermind military operations for the Canadians there. And he stays there for the end of the war. He's a brilliant success. He's the George C. Marshall, for those of you who know that name, to Curry's Eisenhower. He's the staff officer and the administrator in England who manages to bring order out of chaos and training and so on. It's a brilliant performance. He had wanted to stay in Europe because he was first in line probably to command the Canadian Corps as its first Canadian commander when Bing eventually got promoted out of the Canadian Corps having sort of fixed it up, which he did in many, many ways. And he sacrificed that in order to go to England. He was picked for that job because he was far better administrator than Curry, had been a very successful businessman in the pre-war years, and had the political talent necessary to make the job work. <clears throat> and so Curry is by this time the clear heir apparent to being when a Canadian finally gets to command the Canadian Corps, which was now the commitment of the Canadian government. So First Bing and then Curry, who is, of course, the only other commander of the Corps, who takes over right after Vimy. Bing is promoted for the success of Vimy. Uh, Curry uh, uh, has the support of his government 
in terms of standing up this sounds very adversarial, it wasn't anywhere near so adversarial as it portrayed, but in standing up for Canadian interests in the field against the British, okay? That's an important, important asset for Curry when he would become Corps Commander in 1917. Okay, a very important asset. Because he had no other protectors other than Sir Robert Borden. Next, uh, So there's Curry standing beside Sir Douglas Haig. He actually got along quite well, at least Curry admired Haig, despite all the history books that are written about Haig being the principal donkey leading the lions in World War I. Uh, but he was not a corps commander comme les autres, as the French would say. Rather like the Australian Corps, when it was given an Australian commander a year after we did, in other words, in the late spring of 1918, uh, this was not just a colonial core of the BEF anymore because of Borden's attitude and because, but Curry took and ran with that. It was now different. It was not independent, but he had to be consulted in a way that a court commander in the BEF did not have to be consulted. And for the most part, he did well with that power. Now, I want to just talk about Curry's. Uh, if can have the next uh, next slide, please. This is a classic Curry picture. He's uh, conducting exercises. Shortly after he's been corps commander, in July 1917, uh, the commander, uh, the fellow on the on the on your left, is uh, the deputy commander, second in command, then commanding officer of the 38th Battalion from Ottawa. And the man on the right is more important, relatively speaking. That's uh, James McBrien. Future leader of the North Alberta Broken Run Police in the 1930s when he hunted communists with great success. But anyway, he was commander of the 11th Brigade, the 4th Division, and a very, very good brigade commander. So that's classic Curry, hands on, teaching, and so on. Okay. Curry's one, the one quote in Curry, which is always, always quoted, but always remembered now thorough preparation must lead to success, direct, direct uh, neglect or nothing. And this is classic Curry. Generals in the First World War and corps commanders, and Lord knows army commanders, and the overall commander could not direct battles. The communication technology was such that it all fell apart. In short order, it had to be fought as it, as it erupted for small units. Okay? And tactics were developed to, in fact, make the best of that situation. Okay? <laughs> so you couldn't direct the battle during the battle. What you could do was prepare the heck out of the battle before the battle, which is basically training and logistics and making sure every possible contingency and eventuality that you could possibly think of has been planned for. And that was what Curry was a, a past master at. Okay, that is to say he was a learner, such as one could learn in the First World War. It remained right to the end, no matter what you tried, a battle of attrition, a continuous battle of attrition, which was not a very elegant way to fight a war and certainly not a very good way to look good. All right? He believed very much in teamwork and merit. He continued the policy instituted by Bing to emphasize teamwork and to emphasize meritocracy, because otherwise men die. Okay, and of course, in the absence of Hughes and with now the support of the government, and with able administration in London, Curry was able to carry on this policy and in fact perfect it. Okay, he was firm in a crisis. He faced plenty of those. He was confident in his own ability. There's no doubt about that, which is a useful thing for a commander to have. Okay? He was a calculated risk taker. He was not a risk taker. He was a calculated risk taker, and it was also a place for that. And he inspired loyalty among those close to him. The people who got to work with Curry, senior staff officers, senior command, field commanders, and so on, they admired Curry greatly. I'll give some examples later uh, in that. Uh, he, he was not an inspirational leader of his men. He, Bing remained the leader in the hearts of the Canadian Corps right to the end of the war. They called themselves Bing boys, you know, right to the end of the war. And there was no knock on Curry. He just he wasn't much of a public speaker. And when he wrote statements to be read to the troops, they sounded a bit, how should we say, formal. Okay. All right, next picture, please. I want to call this the hidden curry. It sounds very ominous, but it's not meant to be. Um, there's a lot of things about curry, and, and to give part of the game away, historians have tended to practice hero worship. Canadian historians are the ones who write about it. 
Uh, in fact, this hero worship occurring, there are reasons for that I'll get into later, but uh, it, it, it has harmed the man in the sense it's made him look artificial, okay? Where are the flaws? Where are the ground blemishes? We all have. He was a great general, and he was a man with all that that implies. So a few points I want to raise here. If nothing else, they weighed, some of them weighed heavily on him in terms of his nerves during 1918 when he had other things to worry about. His reputation. Second, he, what he had done is he had abandoned his command post, his brigade headquarters, to go look for reinforcements. That's basically what it amounted to. Now, that is not proper practice. Okay, no matter what you, no matter how bad things are, no matter how chaotic you are, you send somebody else. You don't abandon your command post. Uh, that is the offense for which he certainly should have been. He would have been cashiered. He was told he would have been cashiered by the British. He wasn't because, as he said, he was saved. And thank God, he never did that again. And he became an outstanding commander. And it just goes to show you that many of the dozens and dozens, especially in 1914 and 1915, that the British cashiered probably were pretty good. There's some question. It's never been explored whether he had a breakdown uh, or he simply as a militia officer learning the ropes of war against the Germans, simply didn't remember that page of his instruction many years ago, but it was certainly a lapse in judgment, okay? He was completely forgiven by the Canadian officers under him and so on, and as I say, nobody ever held, everybody knew about it, nobody held it against him, but he was afraid that it would come out. He had been a realtor of a sort, actually not a very good sort, as it turned out, in Victoria in the run-up to the First World War during the land boom in Western Canada. And he had got into debt problems and had borrowed, in quotation marks, $10,000, which was serious coin, okay? And today it would be in six figures, borrowed it from the regimental funds of his militia regiment and had never been able to pay it back and making $6,000 a year as Corps commander after the middle of 1917, he wasn't going to be able to pay it back. Um, for people like Hughes looking for reasons to bring Curry down, the fact that he should have gone to jail, quite frankly, uh, was one of the principal causes. It never became public knowledge. And I'll give the game away. Two of his wealthy officers, David Watson, commander of the 4th Division, and Victor Avon, uh, brigade commander of the 11th Brigade in that division who were millionaires both paid his debts in 1918, but it didn't solve the problem of the scandal. Curry's often said in Canadian historical terms to have gotten rid of the politics of the San Jose, the rotten politics, the promotion of friends and all of this sort of stuff. And it's true, Bing got rid of that and Curry kept it down. It was a lot easier for him than it had been for Bing actually. Because Hughes was gone. But the point is, Kerr had a different kind of bad face. And it's obvious when you inspect promotions and so on and so forth, that loyalty to Curry was critical. He felt very vulnerable. He had had no reputation before the war. Some of his subordinate commanders did. He was constantly convinced that he would be replaced unfairly. And he just was. He was insecure about it. Okay. And he wanted people around him who were loyal to him or not, had not been in the past loyal to Hughes. The difference was people like David Watson and uh, uh, Billy Griesbaugh from Edmonton, who commanded the 1st Brigade, uh, who were known conservatives and had been friends of Hughes, not just associates, but friends of Hughes. Uh, he didn't fire them if they were good. But there were a lot of politics going on. He was a sensitive person to deal with in that sense. He was constantly convinced that he was going to be undermined. Those who were loyal and good, he kept far lower churning rate, turnover rate of battalion commanders and so on under Curry than under Bing. Of course, Bing had to get rid of all the dead ones, so that's perhaps we understand that. He was extremely petty in his treatment of Richard Turner. He saw Turner even after he'd been sent to London uh, and doing this incredibly valuable work there for the Canadian war effort. He saw him as constantly planning to come back and oust Curry. There was never any chance of that. But if you go through the correspondence between uh, um, Curry and, and uh, Turner all through 1918, particularly, they had to work closely together. Turner's job, for example, was to produce reinforcements. Who better to consult with than the guy that was going to use them 
and, and Curry is downright rude and suspicious. And if it hadn't been for Turner's, well, the reasons he got the job, his it's excellent capacity to deal with personalities and difficult people, okay, uh, there would have been a complete breakdown in that relationship. Actually, Curry probably would have got his, not his wish, but his fear he would have been replaced. Because Turner was too valuable to have him replaced. There, there, it, it, there was a sensitivity to the man, despite the fact that most people were very loyal to him. He could be a very prickly, difficult personality. And why not? He had all kinds of pressures on him as a commander, and we know he had other pressures on him as well. The 1918 crisis, this is very rarely covered, never covered in Canadian books, but most of you will be aware that the Germans tried one last roll of the dice in the spring of 1918 in a series of offensives that culminated in July uh, of 1918, but they tried to break through the British lines initially, the most, most serious of these offensives, in March and April 1918, and almost did so, and could have won the war. The idea was win the war before the Yankees come over in exhibition numbers and get trained to know which direction to point their gun in, and in 1919, the Americans would have won the damn war, which is true, actually, they would have. Uh, provided the vast amount of the manpower. So the British, in the initial stages of this so-called Kaiser Schlock, Kaiser Offensive, uh, were in really serious trouble. It was 90,000 prisoners. That usually gives you an idea which direction you're going in. Okay? And it was a real, a real close to a debacle. The British, Hague, asked all elements of the, of the uh, British Expeditionary Force, all corps commanders, basically, to make their divisions available uh, as fire brigades. And uh, the crisis didn't last too long, but it lasted long enough for Curry to get the message, okay? Curry had certain difficulties with the British, and he certainly had with some of the British particularly, and their competence and so on. But that wasn't the issue here. He wanted to hold on to the corps. It was by far the largest corps that he had. By far the largest corps, four divisions strong, and they were full strength, big divisions, which they didn't say about the British or Australian divisions at that time. And it, it was a huge force that he thought he you know, said it fought better under Cape Command and all this, but he was basically afraid of, again, his position being undermined. I don't know what else you can say here. It's usually held up as an example, I think quite falsely, of Canadian nationalism flowering during the war, okay? The Australians agreed, just to give an example of the one other group to compare it to. The British didn't need 125,000 men. It's too hard to move. Hard to they move. needed individual, individual divisions. divisions. And eventually, and eventually Curry allowed one division, one second division, 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 division some fighting. Fight. The rest of them took up a longer part of the, of the line, line. So, consideration, so that British units could be used for this. And uh, the British were very, very bitter about this. Canadians just say that it, it's defending Canadian nationalism. That's nonsense. This was one man's concerns. I think they were falsely based. Anyway, um, if you think of the British position at the time, uh, no, we're going to keep Canadian Corps intact because it's the most powerful fighting force we have when it comes to getting on to Berlin. Well, excuse me, sir, but we may not survive the next month. Okay, this was a false priority and nothing else. Ego. Toward the end of the war, Curry, uh, I think from a sense of professionalism and all the senior officers of the Canadian Corps were getting frustrated that their role was not being properly explained in the media, in the press. All the press releases came from the British Army, and it was British Army practice for some good reason, okay, not to mention corps, so as not to give the Germans intelligence as to where a particular units were. Uh, sounds fine in practice, not as good when you've got a nascently independent corps, who for the first time is on the national stage, that is, as men are, and they would like some acknowledgement that the Canadians took Cambrai and not the British Army, et cetera. They were under the command for the last, most of the, the tail end of the, or the last two of the three battles of the Hundred Days campaign, not Amiens, but uh, Drocar Cayenne and then Cambrai and Valenciennes and the Pursuit de Mons, under the command of Sir Henry Horn, first British Army. Okay, and it got to the point toward the end, Curry would barely show up at ceremonies <laughs> that were French were holding to mark the liberation of the long CN, for example. He went with one himself and his aide de camp because he was ordered to go there by one. Uh, and, and monopolized the ceremony at Mons, where the war ended, which was enormously symbolic to the British, where the war had begun. And some of them lost sons, including Henry Horn in 1914. He, in fact, threatened, I mean, or virtually threatened, to shoot any British who showed up at the ceremony because the Canadians were going to get their due. As I say, this was. 
ex explicable, but speaks more of the bad feeling there was between some senior management managers and Curry at the time, and Curry's own ego, for a better way of putting it. But it's quite understandable. The Canadian, we all feel down, but all we deserve some credit. Um, that again reflects a man under enormous pressure, and it reflects a man tired and worn out. It reflects a man who loves the idea of the British Empire, but doesn't know like the idea of the British, which was not uncommon, I might add, at the time among uh, Dominion troops and their senior commanders. Uh, one of Helen's staff officers made the following comment, though, uh, which I think reflects the British point of view someone needs to inform him, being Curry that the First Army consists of more than just the Canadian Corps and some British ancillary units, okay? Um, in fact, the Canadian Corps being as big as it was made up about 60%, three corps in an army, uh, it made up 60% of Horn's army. So, you know, both had a case, but again, it's not the sort of stuff that Princeton. Exaggerated claims during the last stages of the war and yeah, getting to the end, uh, during the last stages of the war, um, again, the news reports all reported the British, but not the Canadians. You have to bear in mind that in 100 days, the Canadians fought in three very sized operations in 60 days. Okay, they assembled three very sized operations in 60 days as well. We suffered 45,000 casualties, 12,000 of them killed in the last 100 days. 20% of all the Canadians who were killed in the First World War are killed after August the 8th, 1918. So, needless to say, with a flood of telegrams coming across the country in the aftermath of a terrible conscription crisis that had torn the country apart, and all these people dying, and no evidence whatsoever in the newspaper for the average parent or wife or brother or, brother or, or sister, sister that the Canadians are, are doing anything. Uh, Borden is under enormous pressure in Parliament and so on, say Sam Hughes, again, as well as the Liberals, uh, to, to put together some kind of report, authentic report, Curry should put a report together on what we're doing. And in fact, Curry assigns two young staff officers. Needless to say, his headquarters has other things to do. This is shortly after uh, uh, the Drocourt Island. It's the beginning of October. And he says, look, I want you to assemble a list of every single unit that we've engaged or defeated all or part of. Now, the German army is in utter chaos at the time, more chaos than the Allies realized. They don't even have divisions anymore. They quit using divisions because they couldn't reinforce them. They got regiments here, battalions there, and you know, camp groups, and so on and so forth. A battlefield is literally covered with one offs, literally covered with guys in this unit and that unit, and they've been temporarily thrown together. Curry has a pretty good understanding that, that this is happening. It's a body count exercise, okay? And what he comes out with is if you add all the engaged or defeated, all or part of that means one guy along the time, one body or one prisoner, we have engaged or defeated one quarter of the German army. This uh, is, is, needless to say, heartwarming, you know, uh, uh, and it even gets in the official Canadian history in the 1960s. It's absurd, of course. It's absolutely absurd. But and Curry was under pressure from the one man who was defending him and he wanted respect, and that's what came out, one quarter of the German army, which has done nothing since but undermine Canada's army's reputation in the minds of non-Canadian historians because it seems an absurd claim. He was politically unstable, suffice to say. He wasn't very good at dealing with people. After the war, there was a famous uh, attacks against him. After Hughes died, Hughes and friends could move to attack Curry. The butcher of Mons, the last day of the war, one Canadian was killed, I think 11 or wounded. Uh, he was under orders from Horn to uh, attack and liberate. They thought the Germans would defend Mons. They turned out to withdraw. They normally did defend, so there was a pre preparation for a pretty serious attack, and they were going to envelop it from both sides. The Canadians got well beyond Mons. In fact, the last Canadian kill was killed about 20 kilometers beyond Mons. But anyway, uh, the idea of the butcher of Mons, that Curry had ordered for ego's sake the uh, liberation of Mons, and, and uh, these lives had died for nothing, and so on and so forth. And he finally uh, sued for life. And he ended up winning in this case, which was a huge issue in 1925 in Canada. In Port Hope, Ontario, there was a newspaper that was sued. Uh, its editor and publisher, a friend of Hughes. And uh, he won, but he got a, a token award. So, you know, in the eyes of the beholder kind of situation. But the British official history came out in 1927, the volume dealing with Second Eve. Uh, senior commanders, in this case, senior Canadian commanders, were given a chance to read it to have input. It was very commendatory 
of curry. It goes on to say all sorts of good things about curry later in the work, those volumes that come out yet. Uh, it is fascinating to see the, uh, almost to a man, all the senior officers in the Canadian Corps, now veterans, rallied around Curry and denounced this. And the letter is going to Sir James Edmonds, who was one of Haig's staff officers who wrote what is generally considered a very good official history. Didn't finish it until 1948, um, well, many volumes. But anyway, uh, uh, Curry was outraged. Again, it implied that he abandoned his command post, which he did. Um, but Canadians had long made peace with this, and they couldn't stand the idea of the British denouncing him. I don't think it's so much a Canadian thing, you know, anti British thing, as it's enormous loyalty to Curry the man. And uh, that entry was modified, uh, largely because, as were the Australian entries over Gallipoli, <laughs> Dominion, now more independent Dominion in the 1920s, Dominion supported British foreign policy and British defense policy was considered worth keeping and not sacrificing over some historical accuracies, okay, that were taken as offenses in the two dominions. Why has a lot of this stuff not come out about Korea? There's no proper biography to this day of Korea. There's three biographies. But one was by a former junior staff officer. Um, one is by a Canadian military historian who didn't deal with his private life at all. He said right out he wouldn't do that. And uh, the third is a more popular account. Um, it's, it's, the feeling seems to have been among historians that if, if Curry is not Superman, he's nothing. And only Canadians write about Canadian military history and tell that story. We know that's true. And therefore, <coughs> Canadian historians only write about Canada. There's this problem of getting. The British historians in both world wars, God knows if you read books, you know this is true, have to acknowledge Canada's role okay, in any kind of way proportionate to its contribution. Um, so that's a fact. If the bad stuff comes out, so now Curry goes from being a, a great commander, which he was, to being <clears throat> somehow nothing. Okay, uh, Hero worship never does the hero justice ever does it justice. Um, so a lot of things are ignored. The embezzlement is ignored. The, the deep thing is ignored in most accounts of Curry today, uh, even by professional historians. The judgment errors in 1918, there were cases we seem to make seized by victory disease, which most journals were. They finally had the hunt on the run. They were going to keep pressing. We suffered some setbacks. Everything wasn't a success. No general has nothing but successes. Historians that airbrushed his rivals, particularly Bing and, Kurt and Turner, out of, out of history. There's a biography came out of Turner a few years ago, which finally, finally revealed what an outstanding World War I career he had, particularly in London. Okay, But there had been an effort to basically chop down everything that looked like an oak tree around, by historians, around Curry. He was absolutely, he wasn't primus inter pares, first among equals, it's just the first and only. And uh, that's smearing the only analogy I can think of is all the people who wrote Kennedy memoirs, all the Kennedy insiders, like President Kennedy, after his assassination, just cut everybody like Johnson and everybody else down, okay, to make Kennedy apparently look good, but didn't do justice to the man. Uh, airbrushing the rivals out is, 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 is the most unfortunate, shall we put it that way. Being, most of my students told me that Curry planned Vinny Ridge, he was the commander of the first division, and he played a leading role in it but below the staff officers and below Bing, okay? He's disappeared, Bing is gone, he's gone so he's the invisible man, like one of those Stalinist pictures in the old days when a potted plant would appear where Comrade so-and-so was. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's most unfair. Even the official Canadian government websites talk along the same lines, it's very sad, uh, because Bing deserves enormous credit for saving the Canadians from themselves, basically. And they thought, and Curry thought that at the time. He always admired Bing as the greatest single mentor he ever had. Cheerleading, as I say, cheerleading doesn't do the job. But this will be had with Curry. He doesn't need cheerleading for heaven's sakes. Okay? Curry was lucky. Lord knows he was lucky. And I can give you in questions and examples when he was lucky. But you got to be good to be lucky. That famous leader, Vince Lombardi of the Green Bay Packers, said that very thing. You know? And it's true. You got to be this problem with being lucky. If you're only lucky, well, then that's a problem. But in many respects, he was an ordinary man. I mean, he wasn't an ordinary man, but a sort of ordinary man grasping the historical moment. He was a bit like Churchill in that regard. You know what I mean? He, his talents 
would never have been noticed had the circumstances not around him. And the circumstances came, they flowered, and he seized the opportunity. That's Curry, okay? Uh, even an ordinary man is still a man with his talents, but also his flaws. Ironically, hero worship never does full justice to the hero. Uh, it oversimplifies a complex man. I forgot my other two slides. If you just that's it, that's it. That was the last one there. So, so beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, at least of his war career, that's Curry in his militia uniform. Uh, nice uniforms. So they still had money left over after they bought those uniforms for him to make off with to pay his real estate debts. And uh, uh, Curry himself. Okay. And I think there's one more here. I want to show you the picture of the guys that bailed him out. Oh, no, it's the end. Is it? Oh, go back one story. Ah, um, yes, yes. That's Curry. Uh, this is 1918, and that's uh, Victor Odlum and uh, David Watson, uh, the two millionaires who paid his debts. But they go to Canada. I think they deserve some credit for that. They never asked for it. kept it secret to the day they died, but it came out other ways. Anyway, that's it. Um, never look at the clock because you might be embarrassed. So um, uh, that's the talk. Okay, we will have a question and answer period. I will ask Pat some questions. We would love questions from the audience. We'll, oh, I don't have my, there we go. There's my microphone on for the uh, Zoom audience. We will take questions uh, from the Zoom audience as well. If you could please write them down and they'll make their way to us. Uh, so any questions from the audience to begin? Go ahead. I'm curious for, uh, you said that Curry is a great general. And I agree with you, by the way. I've I've obviously read a lot less than you have, and I commend you for your presentation. What did Curry do that made him stand above other people of his rank level just before he became the prison guard? Why, did, why do you say he was that good of a, a leader? The uh, British Expeditionary Force at that time, with the Canadian Corps in cooperation, it was post song Battle of the Song, 1968. That was the great eye opener for the British, at least for those who had eyes to open. Okay. Uh, and broadly speaking, there was a sense that, you know, the song was a Pyrrhic victory. There was too many more victories like that, like poor King Jira said many years ago, uh, I'll lose. You know, I mean, they, they couldn't fight like that. I mean, they, they won the Battle of the Song by any, by any uh, standard. I mean, they were victorious. They held the battlefield, but uh, losses were so heavy. And the tactics that we'll be using, the infantry tactics, particularly in the use of artillery, the lack of use of artillery effectively, was such that uh, <coughs> Haig and many, many others, including Bing and uh, Percy Radcliffe, who was his chief of staff, and Curry's man, who's completely forgotten and is very, very important in the history of King Corps, British officer, uh, they all participated in this great uh, learning endeavor, what I call institutionalized learning and then universalized learning. And basically, what they did is it started during the song, they started interviewing surviving battalion commanders and particularly uh, young company commanders as well, even platoon commanders, people who've been in the battle and come out of it, who were officers and asked them what worked, what didn't work, etc. A series of set questions about weapons and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and then there was, uh, you know, like these awful uh, hotel reviews you get, you know, there's always a place for you to write more, okay? And these all survived. It was done in the Australian did it, the Canadians did it, the New Zealand division did it, the British did it. It was a British authorized endeavor. And through the later 1960, that came out with two, this in, the universalized learning was it was all put in for teaching. It was a standard syllabus incorporating all this stuff, and it was updated for the rest of the war. But the big push comes out of the song. So they're gonna fight, they're gonna use infantry tactics a lot different. Uh, small unit tactics, but that's all that can work, possibly work. That's how the battle breaks down anyway, so you might as well train them to fight that way. Uh, much more flexibility, not the rigid plans. They saw that unskilled armies, you know, couldn't possibly direct themselves on the battlefield, so they have rigid plans. We know from the song, rigid plans fell apart, and nobody knew what to do, etc. So the big change, more than infantry tactics, uh, frankly, there's big changes there, but it's artillery. We're going to use artillery much more effectively than more of it, more heavy artillery. And what's called counter battery fire, taking out any strong points and enemy artillery positions ahead of time, which requires all sorts of changes in terms of locating weapons, uh, you know, uh, getting the guns to the gun crews to fire much more accurately and fire off the map and all this. And then what became the barrage work, suppressing the enemy during the march across no man's land. And they're cutting the wire, yes, but harassing fire. The idea of the song was fire a lot of guns at the enemy. You've all seen what it looks like big fountains of dirt going up. All it did was make a mess of the battle. 
actually, but they didn't destroy enemy strong points. I think it's not all of them, I and mean, all of them is important. Um, all the damage done on the Somme, 93,000 British soldiers were killed in one day. That was a bad day, admittedly, but the bad day was done. Most of it was thought to have been done by about 30 machine guns. 30 machine guns. They got a lot of German machine guns. They got a lot of German bunkers and so on. The machine gun crews were, were uh, sheltering, but um, 30 machine guns killed all those men, okay, firing in full ad from the side. Uh, not like bowling balls, you know, like the way a lot of people think and shown on television. And uh, so the idea was that you can't destroy all these things, even though we can get better at destroying them. More heavy artillery, more aggregate fire. We're going to harass them. We're going to keep them down. We're going to fire a creeping barrage or a rolling barrage, uh, train the enemy to fall, uh, the soldiers to follow it, to hug the barrage so that any shorts that fall kill them, but it's in the greater scheme of things, they're safer. And you'll escort them across the battlefield that way. And every attack will be escorted by one of those creeping or rolling barrages. And uh, that was what the sort of field artillery would do. Okay. And now those changes uh, are often forgotten because nobody studies the artillery much in popular history. So the infantry and the local unit and all that. So the emphasis is put on different infantry tactics uh, coming out of that. And it's true, they were, but the, the key thing was artillery to take ground with guns and hold it with men instead of the other way around, okay? And all of this was to be tried in the Battle of Arras in April 1917. Now, those of you who know your dates, oh, something else happens. In fact, the northern flank of the Battle of Arras was to take Vimy Ridge and to do that in a lightning strike, okay? The Battle of Arras itself was much larger and to the south it was designed to provide cover for a big French attack, uh, the Chemin de Dam, northeast of Paris, which failed and developed Arras, but it had ended up led to mutinies in the French army or more politely strikes. Um, but uh, the, the um, Battle of Arras went ahead and Vimy and Arras, the first days of the Battle of Arras, they went on for a month and a half, so same old, same old, and the same result, failure. But Vimy and the very first days of the Battle of Arras, went really, really well. This so-called bite and hold attack where you bite off an area of the enemy's line, saturated with artillery, never go any farther than your own artillery you could cover without moving, it would be very difficult to move all the artillery forward again. And then the infantry would go in and take what was left. Vimy was a textbook case of that. Now, that's a big preamble to say that about the Canadian commanders, the record survives, they're asked, what do you think of this, what do you think of that? Curry is clearly the most insightful and the most open-minded and the most enthusiastic of this. Because he learned the creeping brush from the French too. Well, he observed the French too. The French were about a year ahead all the time. Uh, you know, they, and they had <laughs> to casually less to prove they learned it. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Curry, Curry was clearly of, of, of the three, of the four divisional commanders. One was a permanent force guy, which is not saying much. He was adequate with a great first all. Um, Curry was obviously an outstanding prospect, if you use the sports term, um, rough edges, but an outstanding pro prospect, great attitude, uh, you know, and so on, and learning, and really enthusiastic about trying something different, okay, which was incredibly risky, don't forget, because it might not have worked, because it rained that day, and then, <laughs> then you wouldn't know, you know, what to do, you know, kind of like, etc. It was very important to work the first time and work as well as it did. Uh, Watson was again a kind of an average, you know, commander. Although he was kind of keen on it too. And they were still the uh, third division was still commanded by Louis Lipset, who had been seconded to the Canadian militia from the British Army in Winnipeg before the war, so he enlisted in Winnipeg. But he was a British officer, and uh, he was actually the most opposed to change. Right. Take up what you will. But anyway, that was he just showed qualities of which that was the best. Always find the time to monitor training. Mm -hmm. Always find your time to talk to his um, subordinates, like Bing had taught him. Always ask him, you know, what do you do if that guy dies? You know, right. is this kind of stuff. Preparation. He was. He, he seemed to see the merit of logistical preparation and other preparation more than any of the others. And they all agreed. I might add as well. His his peers supported his appointment as corps commander when it came in June 1917. Not without being told. I'm going to do that. Just ask one more question. Sure. Hughes, Garnet Hughes, mm -hmm. worked with, with Curry. One of the reasons Sam Hughes turned against Curry was because Curry 
refused to promote his son Bernard. Is that, is that true? It's true. I was talking to another gentleman before about Bernard Hughes, and we're talking about you know how <laughs> you can have a bad, wrong name like if Bernard Hughes is named Hughes. Son, you know, was got him in, opened every door for a while, and then after his father died, he closed every door, as did uh, Sam Hughes had a brother who was commanding the 10th Brigade and got fired by Watson as soon as he could get rid of him. Um, Garner Hughes actually was a pretty capable staff officer. You know, he, he probably would have done as well. He, he wasn't his father, I guess, he's, his personality-wise. He certainly wasn't his father. Um, he, um, unfortunately, in history, any merits that he had, and I think he had some, uh, were lost in the glare, okay? And uh, he eventually commanded the 5th Division in England, which was never allowed to go to France because we couldn't reinforce four without conscription. So they couldn't reinforce five. And eventually broken up in 1918 as reinforcements. And he spent a while away the rest of the war basically there, uh, bitter and feeling he hadn't got his chance. Uh, brigade staff officer, like he was, often got to be a divisional staff officer, then got to be a divisional commander, or at least a brigade commander. You know, the staff officer often, a great many of them got to be. It was considered it's useful considered training useful. for a more senior commander. So he should have been in slot, and I think he would have done okay. But he was he was dead on delivery, okay, because of his father's reputation. And when his father fell out, it was a way of kicking Sam. I, I really think it was, and I understand that people took it out on Gar Garnet because he's there. You could, you, could, you could hit him. And, How's your dad doing, Garnet? You know, like that kind of stuff. So. Go ahead. What well, was training? In the militia. What corps was he? He was infantry. He was infantry. He did, because of course there's artillery the artillery attached, at least at the level of the division, and it's allocated to brigades. So battalions would be used to having some knowledge of field artillery, such as you know, we had any at the time and so on. But he um, in fact um, he understood the importance of artillery. He was not an artillery expert, would not have claimed to be. He picks people and encourages them who are very good at artillery. The uh, commander of artillery under Bing and then under Curry was a man named uh, uh, Morrison, who's a former editor of an Ottawa newspaper. It's not widely understood now that Morrison didn't have two clues to rub together <laughs> about artillery. He'd been in the Boer War, and that's where his knowledge was 13 pounder was as far as he went. You know, he was, you might say, why did they keep him on? Well, because he's a huge, uh, successful handler of men. He can pick out guys who should be promoted. He knows where people were, you know, work the best. He's yeah, immune to the Peter Principle kind of promotions and so on. He, he gets people working together really, really well. But there's a wonderful picture I couldn't use today, but showing uh, Morrison standing in one of these formal pictures taken in the middle of nowhere on some chairs they got out of a blown up French farmhouse, or that kind of picture. And there's Morrison and a few staff officers, and either side of them are two men who can't even look at one another. Annie McNaughton, who's counter battery staff officer. Being appointed in that, when that post was established during the winter 1969 70. That's basically, that's basically heavy artillery, the artillery counter, counter battery fire, fire staff officer. Yeah, he, he effectively commanded, commanded that in the that Canadian Corps right, 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 right into the war. And he right. didn't get the position, he got the rank finally at the end for pension purposes. But a British officer in massive command of the heavy artillery, he was sick all the time. He'd been in the Indian Gun Malaria. It's a strange story, nobody knows anything, but all of them oh, massive. But anyway. Um, uh, and then the other the side, side is Alan Brook, Major Alan Brook. Uh, of course, who has, is Sir Alan Brook, right? And one of the British staff officers who spent time with the Canadians in the First World War, like John Dill and uh, Ironside and so on, who went on to bigger things in the British Army, he didn't, wasn't really happy with the Canadian Corps. He, didn't, he couldn't stand McNaughton, and McNaughton couldn't stand him. He was in charge of kind of um, staff officer Royal Artillery, SOAR, which meant field artillery. He was in charge of the project, of the creeping project. And so on. That was Alan Brook. And so those two, he was there, he did so well, of course, he eventually gets promoted and back into the British Army and wants to go in 1918. And then Harry Kerr takes over his protege in Canadian, of course, and goes on to stab McNaughton in the back. It's amazing in World War II. But anyway, it's amazing all this stuff. But yeah, he had very expert staff officers and he kept them there. He knew they understood artillery. And nobody would get in their way. You know, one of the things I used to ask my students. To talk about how gas 
doctrine and prevention of gas poisoning and so on became a huge issue in the Marine Corps, and they were very, very, very good at it. And the guy in charge of it was a captain. And I used to ask him, well, what do you draw from that? Like, how, why would a captain, you know, why wasn't he a major general or something? Like, why would anybody listen? Why would it be Canadian? Why would subordinates listen to when this little pipsqueak showed up? And so I'd say, you got to wear your small box respirator and blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, the answer was because Curry had appointed him. It didn't matter what damn rank he was. You know, they could see that armband, that brass arm, and then he was from Corps headquarters. Why does it live in Curry there? You know, all 290,000, you know, et cetera. So uh, uh, the, the, the staff officer's rank means nothing, but he picked good staff officers and kept them. And that was true in other areas, engineering. Um, medical side, and you name it, commu uh, signals, communications, same thing. What was his role in, in the development of the Canadian Machine Gun Corps? Because the Canadians at Vimy and beyond used machine guns far more aggressively, far more intensively, not defensively, but offensively than anybody else. And we have lost that skill totally. Well, you can speak to that part of it. <laughs> I didn't even know we had machine guns anymore. We don't say much of anything. Although I could bring one of these antiquated anti tank rockets. That, so the Golden Bell claims this morning knocked out a Russian tank. Well, yeah, no, exactly. Anyway, um, again, uh, Raymond Brutonel was a French officer, emigrated to Canada, he quit the French army because of politics. He was a Catholic and anti Republican, and that didn't get you very far in pre war. French Army it caused problems. Uh, but anyway, he came out to Canada and was a businessman and, and joined the Corps. You know the story, but some of the others may not. He became the, one of the, along with McNaughton, they're the only real thinkers in the Canadian Corps. I mean, the real, real innovators. Guys who would have gone to Hague's headquarters if the Canadians hadn't had a policy under Bing and then under Curry of Canadianization that a Canadian could not be promoted beyond the Canadian Corps if they had any use for it. Or McNaughton would have been gone in a heartbeat. I mean, he would have been taken, is what I'm saying. He was right up there with Noel Birch and uh, Bragg, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, who were revitalizing at the same time British artillery along the same lines. And there were British performers of machine guns as an offensive weapon, too. The kid did know that Britain was in the lead. The Canadians, as you say, used them first, first fastest with the most of them, you know, as the saying goes, in an offensive role. Um, and all, all of the both, I have to say Bing because Curry just accepts everything Bing does and Wallace keeps all of it, okay? Because uh, he approves it. But anyway, both of them just keep Rutmel around, who is a bit difficult and a bit different, but he knows machine guns. And so they keep him around and let him do his thing. Uh, I don't think Curry had any particular understanding. I mean, I think understand, the interesting thing is tanks. Curry doesn't really understand tanks. He's not a big fan of tanks as some of his brigade commanders, for example, are. But he decides we should have three tank battalions. The first one goes active on the 2nd of November, 1918. And the other two are forming up. Well, one's a cockpit unit. And uh, one is full of university students, uh, which is a good way to lose the best and the brightest. You know, put them in a tank battalion. But anyway, manpower was a problem. Then. But anyway, uh, one was a francophone conscript unit. And uh, they would have, he, he, he saw, we should have tanks. The British thought tanks were good. Some of his own supporting the commanders thought tanks were good. So he thought tanks were good in that sense. We we're going to have tanks. And he was very good at that kind of thing. He, he, he couldn't be master of everything, needless to say. And uh, he saw his job was, in many ways, directing people, getting smart people and telling them to do their thing and getting it all to come together. Get on the job and then get on with it. Exactly, which is a very good administrative skill. The gentleman in back had a question. Sure, I, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I was reading a book of Sir John Waters. Uh, right. There were uh, Australian weapons, obviously. And he was saying that the time of war continued, we were likely to be British government was going to throw monash and then the various stuff. Here to comment on that. I sure do. Um, a little bit of background here. All this stuff, first they wouldn't have it. There's not a snowball chance in hell of that. Okay, none, zero. I say uh, there's not a snowball chance in hell of that happening. 
none, nada. It's the reasons I'll explain, but um, uh, Monash was the Australian Curry, he was, and, and he was an outstanding general. He was a staff officer by background, got made commander uh, in June of 1918. The Australians moved a little slower than we did on, on this idea that our troops should be commanded by one of our own. But anyway, and he does very well in what remains of the war, what remains of the Australian Imperial Force, which is not much by that time because they didn't have conscription. So they're running out of men in 100 days. But anyway, um, during the 1920s, there was what's called the Battle of Memoirs in England. And Haig died. I think he died in 1925 or so. He died fairly early. Anyway. But the point is, his diary is thoroughly edited by Lady Haig. And other generals were writing their memoirs, all of whom hated Lloyd George, the our political arm of government at the time. And, and a real falling out in 1917 to 1918. And conversely, Lord George was writing his memoirs, which because he's a former prime minister and a good writer and a well-known public figure and so on, the sold well. Anyway, the point is uh, they attacked Lord George and the politicians in general, but particularly him and he attacked the generals as incompetence and all this sort of stuff. And he was the one who first outlined this idea that they've been getting rid of Haig. A lot of people wanted to get rid of Haig, even, even people in the army wanted to get rid of Haig, but there was no more obvious person to replace him who had enough status. Okay, but it, anyway, would have obviously had to go to one of the army commanders, the five army commanders. It wouldn't have made sense, okay, to promote somebody from corps command, skip army command altogether, and make him the army command. Like to go from commanding 100,000 men to over a million combat groups. I mean, that just wasn't practical when you think about it. Uh, Lord George loved saying this, and others who were critical of the army high command in the 1920s, looking back, you know. Uh, were, were like the point at Curry or Monash. And Monash is usually the one picked. I'm not sure why. Anyway, that's the, you know, why the head of Curry. Curry wouldn't have made a very poor staff officer. I think he would have been the first to admit. But anyway, you know, he, he, they would never, why, why would they never? As I said, Lord George does this because it irritates the hell out of the, the generals. It just, just drives them crazy. And he knows it's the one thing that he can, you know, say that makes them most angry of all. Okay, so anyway, uh, it wouldn't have happened, but as I say, nobody, had, nobody would have been allowed to leapfrog. The British provide a little over 80% of the combat troops by 1918. The Dominion contribution is really substantial, and a lot of British historians forget that, just how much of it was, because all our troops were combat troops. None of them were line of supply or anything like that. So uh, they were important, but I don't see General Plumer, commander of uh, what second army or or general rawlinson commander of fourth army you know, etc all of a sudden taking orders from somebody who had been under their command only recently i mean i, I just don't think that that would have been bad for morale you know and there was the practicalities here are they would never have leapfrogged either of the dominion any i don't forget their dominion for a minute they wouldn't have leapfrogged a wonder kind uh corps commander over the army commanders it just wouldn't have been done okay the second problem is a Dominion officer is, I don't care how optimistic you are about Empire Solidarity, a Dominion officer is never going to command. A Dominion amateur, I don't care how accomplished, is never going to command British professionals. It's just not going to be, okay? Uh, so I think there would have been great opposition there. Uh, Monash, it, the irony of Monash is Jewish. So there's no way in God's green earth, it's amazing he got to be commander of the Australian like by the, the Australians' prejudice against him, but which there was plenty of, I might add. But anyway, not so much in the army, but civilian life, political life. Um, Curry didn't know which was his asparagus for. It was always Curry's problem. Curry wasn't even civilized. I mean, he was lower middle class when you think of his background. And he had, had trouble fitting in with the financial elite of the Canadian militia and so on. Okay, now they admired him and all of that's true, but I mean, he, he just didn't fit properly. And he, none of the boxes were ticked except outstanding ability and seeming infinite promise. And I agree with you, both of them fit that category, but they wouldn't have happened, as you say, it just wouldn't have happened. I don't know about what King George said. I, I will say one thing about shock groups, Lloyd George called it the shock groups of the emperor, and my students endlessly, because it's their appealing term. Uh, the trouble is, shock troops, Stoss Truppen, a uh, German phrase, apply to a specific kind of infantry, weak units, and so on. And uh, 
it's, it's wrong to get, it's probably not a good idea to use that term as a general term for good attacking groups, because the Canadians were good attacking groups, but so were a lot of British and so were the Australians and the New Zealand division and some of the American units turned out to be pretty good when they had a chance at the end of the war. Um, you know, I, it's, it's misleading. Uh, we were, in fact, following an identical practice as the British units were. Uh, the whole idea is the interchangeable parts, that's all, right? That's the whole, we don't want to leave units. And uh, like the Germans eventually devolved into and so on. And, and uh, so in fact, we were never, he may have used the term, it was probably current by that time in the papers. And so I might've thought, you know, just used it. But unfortunately it gets confused with March, 1918, shock troops which clearly won the war and it ended up being a very wasteful way of attacking and so on because they're hard to replace and all of this kind of stuff but so that's why uh, he may have used it but it didn't he didn't in, the, in that way okay and the uh, avoiding the canadians i i looked, searched for a long time on the front to figure out where the germans might have attacked and why they you know they attacked the hinge of the two British armies effectively to break the, the nearby hinge of the French and British armies and hope to open a gap and, and so on. And they more or less crushed one of the British armies, fifth army, but um, the Bings almost got crushed but managed to pull back, thus sacrificing the other armies, et cetera, and opening a big gap for the French, the French filled after some huffing and puffing and so on and so forth. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence, no, that they did that. They avoided the Canadians because of where they wanted to get to and had the attack the Canadians, um, it's a real question. Uh, because one of the tragedies of the war, none of the British forces put much emphasis on defense. And in the Canadian Corps records, they develop a defensive doctrine of, of, of elastic defense is what only after the Germans attack elsewhere. I mean, that's how slack even the Canadians were. It just wasn't British practice that they'd attacked nonstop for what, three years. And basically, and, and you know, they just got into a, a false sense of security. The Germans would never attack. And so uh, the Canadians might well have been overrun, um, maybe not quite as quickly and so on. But uh, the other problem would have been if they'd been enveloped. It would have been a real tragedy to have the Canadian Corps captured, you know, cut off from supplies and have to surrender. But they were quite a ways to the north, as you probably know, where, to where they were uh, around Lons, within the area. And the, uh, the Germans attacked down there. Uh, well, east of Amiens, basically. No. So, no, there's no evidence of that. The Germans knew who the Canadians were, though. I mean, they refer to the Canadians as Canadians. They, they see them as a colonial corps, and uh, uh, that's that's a good fighting corps. And if they know where they are, chances are that's where an attack's going to be, which is why such enormous effort was made at Amiens in August 1918, the first of the great 100 days offensive, uh, to move them secretly. And successfully, and the Australians were already there, but had to move a bit because the Germans by that time associated the Australian Corps and Canadian Corps with attacking. The other reason they associated the Canadian Corps with attacking is because Curry had refused to allow the Canadian Corps to participate in the battles in the spring to stop the German attack, okay, as I explained to you. And as a result, they were the most formidable part of the BEF as yet untouched, at full strength, and so on. So the Germans knew wherever the Canadians were going to be, they were going to attack us. Virtually all the British Army had been through the meat grinder and the Australians in the Kaiserschlacht. And many had lost, well, divisions had disappeared in the case of the British, because that's they got 90,000 prisoners. You know? And uh, so it was, it was a real tough situation. So I think it was a combination of them associating the Canadians with attacking and uh, and they're really fresh. It was their turn. It was our turn. Because my students used to always say, after I painted with great pride, you know, the 100 Days campaign and so on, well, the British will fight to the last Canadian kind of thing, you know. Well, in fact, I mean, a lot of people thought that at the time, you know, parents. Uh, I wasn't, at least, you know, it's just, it was our turn. Is that Alex back there? Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the Canadian military currently has a tendency for extremely large staffs with not a lot of soldiers. Um, I, I wonder philosophically how Curry felt about the size of the staffs. Was he a lean and mean or did he 
Uh, he he was um, uh, basically following British established practice. That is, there was an order of bat, you know, order of battle for division headquarters and so on, if you like a bit of putting it. And they were allowed a certain number of GSO ones, GSO twos, GSO threes, clerks, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, he uh, Bing was a great believer in staff, and he had a brilliant staff officer, Percy Wright, that was chief of staff of the Canadian Corps from spring of 1916 to the end of the war. As a logistics chief, uh, George Farmer was chief of logistics, right from that. They, the three of them came together and used this got rid of Bing, Radcliffe, Farmer. And uh, anyway, uh, so they believed in staff, so I'm sure he added a few people, okay? But the staffs were restricted, bottom line, they were restricted by um, the nominal size assigned to them by the British. The one exception to that, which was made great use of by Bing and then by Curry, was a government policy of, of, of called Canadianization, which meant that as much as possible, uh, combat commanders first should be made Canadian, to find them. And then staff officers, were much harder to find, should be made Canadian. And the way it was done was by ignoring uh, the long course. In peacetime, the trained staff officers at Camberley College and institute a what was called uh, uh, learning, the learner position. They were given a short formal course in England, about three months, and then they were assigned an existing staff officer to learn his, a British staff officer to learn his job. So during this period, like in Vimy, there'd be about 20 British staff officers, mostly at headquarters, core headquarters, and the others scattered all four the principal divisional staff officers and then a few others scattered at the divisional level, okay? Um, and so extra that meant extra staff officers. That meant you got an extra staff officer basically under that rule in a Canadian division and a Canadian Corps headquarters for every British staff officer you have. And the British staff officers served us really, really well and beyond well, okay? But um, they, were really, they were being replaced and uh, and it meant that these learner positions were there. So there was in fact considerably extra staff officer capacity at Canadian Corps headquarters than there would have been at a comparable British Corps headquarters during that period. And that continues right up all of the most senior positions by the end of the war are in fact all the positions are Canadian except Farmer, the logistics guy. Because a Canadian is a all Peter Canadian who served his career was in the British Army. He graduated from RMC, then wanted to be in the real army and went off to go to England. A guy named Ross Hader, but uh, he became in the very last week of the war when a lot of promotions were going on for pension purposes and otherwise. Uh, he became uh, head staff officer, became Corps replacing Radcliffe. So that answers your question. I hope, like it, that, that in fact the real truth is that there's more, but it's because of a Canadian policy. Yeah. I think he may have not been served very well. I just read a biography of Stuart Mingles, who was the chief of British intelligence in 1939 mm -hmm. And in the First World War, he was major in the intelligence section of the British Army. And there was a brigadier who was head of the intelligence section who fed erroneous information came about how weak some of the German units were and how poor their morale was because he didn't want to disturb A and his feeling of awkwardness. And so he got poor, bad information on which he made many of his plans, perhaps even the Battle of the Song. Well, there's no doubt that the, the, the gentleman who, for much of the war, held the position as the chief of intelligence at general headquarters was not among the best and the brightest. Okay, and uh, um, so I'll, that flat out, that part's true. Okay, I mean for sure that part's true. And then there was a pressure to uh, um, some men felt more pressure than others in that position where they they had a very senior job and they depended on the goodwill of and their own success, you know, but on the goodwill of the person above them, right? He's their patron, 
uh, don't stand up to that too well. And, and they, you know, they, they, there's a danger that you'll tell people what they want to hear and so on and so forth, right? And uh, the other, so all that's true, all that's true. That wasn't, it wasn't the best appointment made. On the other hand, and there's some very good studies now, more recently about uh, British studies of intelligence gathering and all of this. And obviously that's one area the British and French shared a lot. They drew up an order of battle and what divisions were where and what their histories were like. And they constantly you know, interviewed prisoners and tried to find out where, you know, what, their, what their reinforcement rates were like and what morale was like and all these kinds of things. It was just very difficult to get intelligence, very difficult to get intelligence in the First World War. Prisoners who, of course, that's a whole study unto itself, tell you what they think you want to hear because otherwise you might shoot them. I mean, uh -huh. you know, I mean, they're not, as, and they may be, of course, overwhelmed by PTSD and God knows what, but I mean, the point is, they're, you know, they're not the best source of information. Maybe in collectively they can be, you know, but individually, it's no problem. Uh, document capture, the most you're going to capture is, is all these raids we indulge in, is something in the very front line defenses. So what the hell is going to be there? You know, exactly, you know, how the date is it? Uh, can you interpret it properly? There are spies. God knows the French keep all kinds of, they try to keep all kinds of spy networks, and the British too, using French people behind the lines in occupied France. And, but it's hard to get the information forward. It's pre radio, and, you know, people got to sneak things in a bunch of potatoes and try to smuggle them across the line, and et cetera, et cetera, and send pigeons the whole bit. Uh, it's just very, very difficult. So intelligence is very poor. So even the most brilliant intelligence people i think in fairness that was one area that just wasn't going to be very a shining light in the first world war it just wasn't there's no doubt Haig was optimistic he was an optimist by nature god knows except it screwed up because of it it was necessary because like if you got if you were a pessimist like no you're gonna you know exactly it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so it's amazing how Haig held himself together i think i mean i'm no great fan of Haig's, but he's better than the first people think and not as good as his supporters who are very few in number think. but uh yeah no the intelligence was poor and uh, like it was always the case they read into it what they want you know that's the whole problem with intelligence you get brilliant intelligence stalin spy victor sorga in japan Got all the plans and everything basically for Operation Barbarossa, and Stalin didn't believe it. You know, that's the obvious problem. So they didn't they didn't get the plans. You know what I mean? But a lot of this stuff was misinterpreted. And uh, you see this right to the end of the war. Uh, they have this overwhelming feeling that the, the German offensives in the spring and early summer of 1918 convinced Bosch, the overall commander, Leitan, commander of the French Field Army. Haig, commander of the British Empire Field Army, and everybody else in between, that the Germans were just awesome. They had thought they were almost worn out, and they were almost worn out. But anyway, the point is, they, this one last event. Thereafter, you see, oh, the Germans are going to have 250 divisions by, you know, 1919, and we're, we're barely hanging on by a thread. And all. I mean, it's just, they just go completely to the other extreme, which at least meant they learned a lesson, okay, because they were completely surprised that the German attack. But we know it was the last roll of the dice. They pulled about a million men out of Russia, you know, to give them some extra troops. And they just, it was a hope and a prayer. And actually, and they ended up working for our advantage. They exhausted what army they had left, you know. Uh, but I mean, so the intelligence, that's, you know, I'm rambling again. My dog doesn't mind, but you people <laughs> probably do. Um, the, the intelligence was hard to gather, I guess is what I'm saying. And it was poorly interpreted. That's absolutely true. French do a much better job. Pat, can I ask a question? Um, sure. You mentioned you have to be good to be lucky. Can you talk about some times when Curry was lucky? Well, for those of you who've heard of the Battle of Canal de Nord, which is the last major battle we fight just in front of uh, Cambrai in uh, October, late September, early October 1918, um, he put his army in a position to basically pierce a narrow part of the German front, this canal had been built but not finished and parts of it were flooded and parts of it were dry and he was going to attack it across the dry part and uh and then fan out he considered his greatest success of the war by far okay and uh, there was a lot of talk some of it exaggerated in Canadian history books of british people not approving of it and doubting it might work and you know all this kind of stuff it, it was, was very risky, risky because you mass a lot of men and the germans ever find out about it 
you know, they, they blow the shit out of them with artillery. It really, really could have been a disaster, a debacle of the first order. The Germans just, they aren't coordinating anything right now. They're eating their horses. They can't pull their artillery. They're running out of ammunition. And the long and the short of it is, even though they have a sense that the buildup is occurring there, they have nothing to really hit at it with. And there's rivalries between adjacent sectors and all of this kind of nonsense. You'd think they'd have gotten over by now. But anyway, so he gets away with it. Uh, I mean, generally, Curry looks good at the end of the war. There are a series of generals who we now hold up as the ones who learned and the ones who were actually good. They all have money to come and they all do well in the final offenses that win the war. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're fighting a German army, which is shot at the door. So in that sense, um, something like Vimy, what the Somme does, when they're using poor tactics, but it is a lot harder. To get any kind of a success on the Somme, you're fighting what is still the German army you know, under very favorable conditions to it. Uh, by 1918, it's okay, the Germans still shoot. There's a lot of machine guns, a lot of guys were killed and wounded, and so on, but they, they aren't what they were. Neither are we, I might add. I used to stress to my students, you know, the Canadian army in the fall of 1918 consists of. The long forgotten, although a recent book has finally given them their due, about a quarter of the soldiers are conscripts and they fight very well. Okay. And the other three quarters are all veterans. I mean, there's nobody's enlisted in the army in 1917, a few thousand men a month. Okay. Which is why we need conscription, you know. And, and uh, everybody's been in there since 1916, not necessarily at the front, but there's a lot of guys who are long serving guys, guys coming back from wounds. Uh, a lot of guys with PTSD. I mean, you know, they're, they're, there's the only two kinds of soldiers we have: veterans who don't want to be the last guy to die in a war that's already won but not yet over, and conscripts who are fresh and, and so on and so forth, full of enthusiasm. And uh, uh, the Germans, we have much better staff work, though, much better artillery, much better all the ancillaries, the vast, the best we had, we're the best at blowing up things than we ever were. We fired more artillery shells on one dumb little hill near Valenciennes on the 2nd of November, 1918, an attack that will be by two battalions that were fired in the entire Boer War, you know, and partly to get rid of it because they know the war is going to end soon, so they don't want a bunch of artillery flying around, might as well kill Germans with it. But the point is they have, they have a two battalion attack supported by 14 regiments of field and Garrison or heavy artillery. I mean, mind boggling, you know? So that's what makes it, but I think it's a disservice to all the men who died and the quality of the men who enlisted first. I'm not saying the rest were cowards and five foot two and bandy legs. I'm just saying that as we go through all those men, you know, of course, what's left by 1918 is it's not endlessly as good, you know? They're brave, they're not physically fit. Older, some of them, many are younger, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of veterans who are good soldiers, but obviously are probably shouldn't be there anymore. But they've done their bit and then conscript. But everything else about the army is is on is the fact that we can plan maybe we had three three months to plan Vimy. And to fire a barrage, we had three weeks at the Germans that knocked out something like eighty three percent of their heavy artillery position. Field artillery, sure, the field and heavy artillery. Just a brilliant artillery performance using the new, the first time using these new techniques. Okay. And on the end, when we break through, advance 13 kilometers. They didn't even measure advances in kilometers in the first war. The British did it in wait, yards. So they'd have these astonishing 17,000 yard advance, but meaningless. Who the hell knew what 17,000 yards was? Why didn't they say miles? Well, they didn't tell you how to say miles in the old days. Uh, anyway, they, they, uh, the artillery barrage at on the end was 45 minutes. And they didn't even, it just appeared there that week. The planning for those three big attacks, Brocourt Dan, Aldenord, and Amiens, basically lasted, the, the planning and preparation lasted one week for a four division attack. Okay, so but Vimy, three months. One week. That tells you what got a lot better. But I think the army was at the end of its tether, basically, you know, in many ways. 
did Curry embrace the idea that he was Superman? <laughs> I should have answered right away, no. Um, I think he began to, I think it would be impossible for him not to have come to think of himself as really good. I think he took risks, I think he took some risks toward the end. Um, hunt on the run stuff, you know. Um, that were unwise, I could go into details, but I'll save you that. But um, uh, there are some examples which I think were really quite appalling failures by him and his British chief of staff by that time, a man named Norman Weber, Ox Weber, who was a real gung-ho guy, okay? And um, I think there were times he um, was borderline uh, um, uh, infected with victory disease, which I think is inevitable. I, I don't think it ever got out of hand. I think that's important, okay? Um, and there has never been an account First biography of Curry was researched in 1930 to 34, not published till after the war. This is the one by his junior staff officer, Hugh Urquhart. And Urquhart had the benefit in 1930 of sending off, you know, nice little typed out questionnaires to God knows everybody was still alive nearly except Hay, and, you know, all kinds of people, British and Canadian. And he got candid answers back. It was remarkable. It was a remarkable. It was at McGill University, nobody hardly anybody knows you're there. You never get used, you know. And, and, uh, but, um, all these things photocopied now. Anyway, um, you go through there, and you go through there, and you go through there. You can say it's self-selecting. You want to say you go through there, and you never find anybody, any of his peers, or you know, media subordinates, critical of him. After he's dead, he died in what 1931, 29. And uh, they're all full of praise, in fact. Of him. You can tell when people don't say anything that they don't like, like somebody. They criticize. don't criticize him, but they don't, you know. People went out of his way, so they rallied around him, and the official history appeared to, quote, smear him about the leaving his command post at Second East. And uh, there's no evidence that he was seen as an egotist, I guess I'm saying, by by his subordinates, that he was universally fair, uh, that they were all pulling together, and so on. So I don't think he got got the better of him. He didn't become like a mini MacArthur or something like that. But I do think he got overconfident. They all got kind of overconfident toward the end because, I mean, they'd been waiting for a long time for this to happen. And clearly the Germans had lost. It's a question of chasing them into the Rhine, you know? Yeah, exactly. And then you have to ask yourself, what what kind of a what kind of a what qualities do you have to have? This is, you know, you have to have an amount of ego. God, you have to believe. You want some damn general who doesn't believe in himself. You know, you don't want Hamlet, you know, commanding you, um, especially when your life is on the line. You know, um, the troops used to say that the thing they liked about him, I think, it was right up to battalion commanders, that level of officer. Curry, Curry prepared us as best we could. We, we could see we were prepared and well-trained. And we all thought a lot of people were going to die all the time. We've got it's a war. You know, it's not that so much, but it's not even heavy losses. Necessarily. We achieved something. But there was a real belief that he was thorough, thoroughly prepared, and therefore, by, by implicit implication, uh, had their best interests at heart. You know, because he couldn't do what a battalion commander could do, which was share their perils. Go ahead. Can I uh, ask you, uh, you talked about counter-battery fire. Uh, which worked well at Vivian. It had to work well at Vivian to take out the German gun position because it was indirect fire support way behind the German lines and they had to take it out. It could have been a bad day. Bad day. Bad day yeah. It pushed for the radar and all that. So, I, I, and I've read a little bit about how we did sound ranging and we did flash spotting. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a the, the third thing, just to mention it because it is important, especially with bigger things that can't move as easily, is, is uh, aerial photography. Okay. Uh, sound ray, they, they figured out a way what they wanted to be able to do, and they weren't able to do this as well at Vimy as they were able to do later, hence the 45 minute garages to do for three weeks when they were at Vimy. But um, is they wanted to be able to fire off the map. That was the expression we got. Okay. So what it means is that you could be given the coordinates of the target and hit it the first time. Not have to range a few times. 
and spot where, you know, where the shells fell. So typically with an airplane. And uh, so that required a couple of innovations. First, you had to locate, accurately locate things. That's where flash spotting and sound ranging come in. German guns would always randomly shoot for range. As our guns did. In fact, if you stopped doing that, that was not good, you know, because it meant you're up to no good. So anyway, we we kept that up. But the Germans would randomly, you know, on the, on the assumption that a few random shots wouldn't really give their location away, not to the point where it would do any harm. And so what you do is you set up microphones, basically it's triangulation. You set up microphones a suitable distance apart on the front line, and you would determine the angle of the sound coming to those particular positions, and then by you know Pythagorean and all this stuff. You know, geometry, you could figure out the exact location, survey the location in effect. So sound ranging, we used that in flash spotting. If they fired in the daytime, particularly, you'd see a bit of a flash or some smoke. And you do the same thing. You would, using a very accurate measurement device, a surveying instrument separated by a known baseline of half a kilometer or a kilometer or more, more accurate. You would take an accurate bearing on that, and then that would be recorded. And plotted on a map. So that's what sound range and flash spotting are for. They were for using geometric surveying triangulation to locate the exact position of something. Doesn't solve your problem. It solves the problem of where the damn gun is that you want to hit, doesn't solve hitting it. That required doing frequent tests, barrel wear is a problem, um, uh, primer charge. In other words, it doesn't shoot the gun out quite the muzzle velocity, and therefore, as far as it was supposed to go, because some. But he was distracted from their work, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But barrel wear was a real problem because you can't be constantly replacing the barrels unless they're really worn out because it, that means another gun is not made and there's a, there's a manufacturing problem, okay? So anyway, what they would do is they would uh, measure, uh, fire the gun for fun with a blank, basically, with a, through a couple of bed sheets that were electrified. I'm simplifying here. And they could measure the muzzle velocity very accurately, very accurately. The exit muzzle velocity of the gun with the barrel, firing a, a blank cartridge of the appropriate size for the caliber, so how much gas was leaking out through the barrel, basically, okay? And they would adjust ranging accordingly. They would now know that when that gun is set to fire, uh, uh, the direction doesn't matter, but elevation and it could fall 4.8 kilometers away, it's actually going to fall 4.4 kilometers away. It's going to fall short. So what you do, of course, is set it at 5.2. I mean, that's simplifying things, but very, very complex charts were set up. And, and these tests were done about every week on um, muzzle velocity of, of each individual gun. No, it was British were doing this all at the same time. There was almost nothing actually that was uniquely Canadian. Uh, that's seen as almost an insult by some popular historians. You know what I mean? But because uh, if we weren't more, if, if, if we were fewer than the British, we were better than the British, you know, that kind of argument. The British were doing all this at the same time. Um, it's the one area in which we had somebody, McNaughton, who was in the forefront of it. He was right up there with the, I could name some names, but the people at Higgs headquarters who, who had been brought to Higgs headquarters because they were doing this kind of thing at the lower level, typically the core level, and had been noticed and were brought to central headquarters so they could be universalized, okay? So this is the way all artillery was trained now. And a good proof of this is that never do we attack, ever, 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 as the war goes on from Vinny onward, without a substantial amount of British artillery. And they would be brought into the line shortly before the attack, you know, and, and they fit in seamlessly. So the question becomes, how do they fit in seamlessly? For example, at the Vimy, even early on, a third of the field artillery, and almost all the heavy was British. That was typically kept at the corps level or increasingly at the army level, allocated to those units that were attacking. And so they would maximize the use of what you had rather than have it attached. Uh, uh, Canadians were actually told, and the Australians, don't bother making much heavy artillery. We made three uh, artillery bombardment groups, as they were called, but uh, mostly the British would do that. And we worry about infantry and machine gun battalions and all this kind of stuff. So there's always a lot of British artillery. And that our artillery clearly had to move seamlessly from unit to unit, from British unit to British unit, then to the Dominion units. And it did. And that's, I think, the best proof you can have that all the techniques that were being developed, it's not that the Canadians weren't innovating. But as soon as we innovated, we told their best. I mean, that was the whole point of institutionalized learning and these after action reports and all this stuff. And then universalizing it in 
in tactical doctrine that would be taught both to the old guys and certainly to all the reinforcements. So they would fit in, they would hit the ground running, so to speak, you know. Why do you think historians have been so reluctant to talk about Curry's flaws? I think because, I mean, early on, I think it was being gentlemen, but I think later on, more recently, in the professional stories today, it's, is this idea that somehow if, if, if <laughs> I sound paranoid myself here, but that there are other historians out there, to, um, British historians, <laughs> ready to spot Curry's flaws or something because we build him up so much that, that somehow if Curry, if, if, I mean, if Curry was a crook, I mean, you know, that's, he would have gone to jail for what he did, you know, and it's a good thing he didn't. And we've all made mistakes. I have no, I won't tell you what mine were, but I'm just saying that I did things that I'm ashamed of and all of that, you know. Um, I think most of us, I won't ask for a show of hands, but you know, um, anyway, I mean, you know, they, 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 it, but what he did was bad to understand the circumstances. I think is interesting. He was a married man with kids. He was stable at the time. Things weren't working out for him. Um, I mean, you know, and he did what he did and then he couldn't pay it back. And, uh, you know, the fact that other people who knew about it forgave him and, and helped him out, you know, because he was such a good general. I mean, his, his peers, you know. Um, he, 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 he has a diary in which he, he, he puts a, a prude, I think most people were prudes, that men, you know, were, you know, Puritans, sort of the way they were brought up, didn't know all that much about sex except to do it. But I mean, anyway, um, he used to write in his notebook, he's, he told these little dirty limericks by people, you know, it, I mean, he, and he'd write them down, one in particular, which is it's not, not dirty at all, like, you know, uh, has so many out of date uh, words in it that you have, probably have to translate it to figure out what it's about. But the point is that he was interested in stuff like that. And he, he um, I just, there's a lot of things. He, hmm? Yeah, 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 no, well, now he'd be cashiered for that. But um, anyway, uh, it, 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 some people should be cashiered for that, but not for, not for a limerick. Um, but anyway, there was, there was, uh, he doesn't seem to have had a drinking problem or anything like that. His marriage lasted, it seemed to be good. Um, you know, I'm what can say, he was overweight, you know, care about for the grace of God, go I, you know. Um, he used to play first base for the core headquarters baseball team. And there was a case one time, they'd play always, uh, he'd take enough guys with him, the minions and so on, they could play local units when they toured, because it was good for morale to see that. Curry, you know, get struck out, that kind of thing, you know. And baseball was very popular in the court. Uh, some battalions built professional teams and so on. It was so obsessed with it. But anyway, there was a the French liaison officer at Corps headquarters that weighed more than Curry did. And he was a big man, too, but, you know, so well over six feet. And he ran into Curry at first base one time. It caused a collision. And there was this great concern about whether Curry had hurt himself. My God, the connections. <laughs> You know, and it, he got up, you know, both okay, both out of breath. Kind of stuff. Uh, he just seemed to be a normal guy. And he, after the war, he fit relatively seamlessly into the upper middle class. He became chancellor of the Guilds University and so on and rub shoulders and, uh, with the great and the near great of the Montreal Anglo business community and all that kind of thing. He seemed to be accepted by them, his reputation as father. So I don't know why there's this concern about saying any flaw at all, any kind of military flaw any kind of personal flaw, but it's clearly there. Uh, he's, we only have one other Canadian general that's ever been written about, and that's Turner, a very good PhD dissertation, which has been published, uh, outlining for the first time widely his enormous role and his great skills, you know, and uh, nobody else has been written about. That's, that's another side of this. They don't want to talk anything negative about Curry, and they don't want to write about anybody else. I mean, we, we you know, it's just, you know, it speaks a little to our insecurity, maybe, with, with our national identity. Well, it's been, yeah, been particularly bad with Curry. I don't know. I, I, don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But there's nothing awful. I mean, he's, I think, as I say, rather like Churchill. Most of us read about Churchill and we find out his idiosyncrasies. And we keep remembering we will fight on the landing grounds. We will fight it, you know, we keep remembering him seeing Hitler for what he was and so on and so forth. It's not the indispensable man, but. My God, you know, we forgive him this little problems. Okay. Is there a sort of Canadian curse that we really never talk about ourselves? No. I, 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 I love my American cousins, but they have, they have no 
hesitancy at all about talking about themselves, even when they didn't need to do oh, I think I think you're being a bit unfair there. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're criticizing. No, it's not a criticism. I didn't say that. Uh, I think I'd yeah. like to thank right. you for this thought-provoking talk. I'm looking forward to your proper biography of Arthur Curry once you finish the KOCR history. Maybe that'll be in your future. It sure, it sure is needed because it would allow you to tell, of course, more than just Curry's story. Tell the story of the core in a new way from sort of first principles. To tie the British in more. We have a tendency to ignore the British to the point where maps don't even show the British on either flank. Know, kind of thing, which is silly. It, it was the grass, uh, maybe World War II was the last great imperial army, but certainly World War I was a great imperial army, the British Empire. And we were no different than the Indian units in the sense we were colonial, special kind of colony, the dominions, you know, but in the British Army. It was, it was a remarkable achievement, you know. Our achievement within that was remarkable, but the achievement of the BEF as, a, as this great colonial enterprise was also quite remarkable. Yeah. Well, thank you. We'll look forward to that book too. Well, my dog will read it first. <laughs> thank you all very much. I think we've all enjoyed this fascinating discussion. And uh, before we go, I'd like to thank you for attending in person. Thank our Zoom audience. And I'd also like to thank Angela and Toki, our communications team, for putting a lot of work into making this happen as well as Anna Cocott, who has been juggling uh, taking care of her brand new baby, uh, as well as putting on this, this lecture. So thank you for all your support. Thank you to, to Pat. We thank really you. enjoyed having you here today. And um, please tune in on June the 10th is our next Lunch and Learn with uh, Dr. Mike Beckhold, who will be talking about uh, Vice Air Marshal uh, Ray Collish. Roy Collish. Roy Collish. Roy Collish. I'll be learning about him then. And uh, we also have um, an, an evening speaker coming up on May the 24th on Zoom. So I hope you join us. Thank you. We'll take all of you.